Hello and welcome to Portfolio Matters. In today's share talk, we will be discussing the ESG darling Drax, the power station in North Yorkshire. But before we do that, Richard will read the disclaimer. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding the topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> Tell us about Drax, Keith. Drax. Now, why are we talking about Drax? is a much larger company than we normally cover. Well, the reason we're covering Drax is because its share price has been on an absolute tear. It, uh, in March of last year, it was below 140, and it's currently at £3.70. So it's up 250%, or sorry, 150%. Yeah. Now, what does it do? Drax has an enormous power station in North Yorkshire which was coal and they switched to progressively burning biomass they still burn a bit of coal and they have and gas so it's mainly um gas and biomass currently mm -hmm. um it also manufactures wooden pellets in louisiana for the biomass and then imports it across the atlantic to burn here so that sounds energy efficient keith well, we will go into all this. Um, and it's repositioned itself as a sustainable energy producer. So it's also experimenting with carbon capture technology. And when you read the annual report, it is all about how sustainability and how it's going to be at the forefront of the moon to sustainable energy in this country. Right. It's got a market cap of 1.6 billion, but an enterprise value of 2.9. So it's got a lot of debt and it has been using um, debt to buy um, energy producers, which are sustainable, eco-friendly. However, everything looks good on the current business model, but we are going to really question the business model, whether it's sustainable. And actually, I really intensely dislike this company. I don't think it's actually an energy producer. I think its main business is producing an endless stream of eco-friendly guff, PR guff, in order to capture government subsidies, of which it is the beneficiary of £980 million pounds worth in 2019. Well, that's an extraordinary amount. Okay, so positives. Dividend yield looks good and is well covered. It, I think the reason the share price has done so well is that it's positioning itself to be sustainable, ESG friendly, and it's a large company with an ESG badge and all the ESG funds are probably have limited options and are buying it. Mm -hmm. Biomass is currently exempt from the carbon tax, which gives it an advantage, price advantage. Now, according to Drax, it claims biomass produces 80% less carbon dioxide than burning coal. Now, we're going to question that. And it's as part of its sustainability drive, it will be stopping the um, production of coal and it aims to have completely stopped burning coal by 2025. It's uh, aiming for 2022, but anyway, right. soon. Negatives. It's wholly dependent on it, government subsidies. These are quite well hidden in the um, annual report, but if you do enough digging, it turns out they, they're the beneficiaries of 980 million pounds a year in government subsidies. Also, the electricity price in the UK is being steadily undermined, undermined by the growth of renewables, which on a sunny, windy day produce 
lots of electricity at zero marginal cost. Also, there are whole websites um, dedicated to trying to undermine DRAX and remove the biomass subsidies. They hate biomass. And part of this presentation will be to discuss why they just hate biomass and okay. whether they are right. Wow. So Chatham House estimate that biomass actually, actually produces more CO2 than burning coal, which is in direct contradiction to what Drax are claiming. Right. Okay, so when you read the Drax annual report, this is what they say their purpose is, enabling a zero carbon, lower cost energy future. Everything is about carbon negative, sustainability, nice pretty pictures. It's, you actually find it quite difficult to find a picture of their aging power stations. <laughs> And the other thing, the other thing is they talk constantly about EBITDA, and I question whether EBITDA is a proper metric for this business, given that it is a big, capital-intensive business with debt, buying stocks for debt, which means the interest charge is important, yeah. and above all, the depreciation charge is important. You know, your power stations need constant investment to keep them going. Yeah. And ignoring the depreciation charge, I think, is dangerous. Um, <clears throat> and you'll see that um, it's... I, I, I also noticed, Keith, it's 30% increase in, in adjusted EBITDA. Of course, adjusted EBITDA is even more dangerous because people put all sorts of adjustments to make their EBITDA look good. And if you don't understand what the adjustments are, you don't necessarily understand what the business is doing. Yes, but I really exactly. dislike adjusted EBITDA. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, we're going to question the business model of this company and the way it presents itself. Um, so I think the key takeaways are, you know, it's just constantly talks about sustainability and how it's uh, move, moving the UK to... Um, carbon neutrality and it's itself to um, actually reducing carbon from the atmosphere. So being carbon negative. So here we go. It's claiming you know, 2030, 2040, it will have carbon capture technology, which will actually capture more carbon than it produces. Now, this is on the basis of a pilot scheme, which is currently in operation and which they're being paid by the government for, um, and is entirely experimental and unproven. Yeah. Now, this chart shows their trading. And what I wanted you to take away from this is the average price they've achieved for their power. So you see in 2020, their contracted power is at 53.8 pounds per megawatt hour, declining in 2021 to 49, in 2022 to 48.2. And that is important because their biomass currently costs them 75 pounds per megawatt hour, and they have a target of reducing that to 50 pounds per hour by 2027, and you'll notice where if you read the small print, they use a, that 50 pounds target is based on a pound uh, US dollar exchange rate of 145, which is above where it is now. The actual pound sterling exchange rate is 136. And if you use that exchange rate, it's 53. But okay, anyway, this is a this is a business that makes a gross loss, but nevertheless manages to pay substantial dividends. Yes. Well, it pays its dividends out of. The, yeah, the, basically, subsidies. this business is completely unsustainable without government subsidies. Um, and this is um, their carbon capture process, which they are claiming will result in them being carbon neutral in future but it uses a solvent that 
they discuss without providing any details. Anyway, it is, um, you know, unproven. And it's, this is a pilot scheme. They are moving to getting rid of coal. So, and you'll see here, coal closure represents progress towards profitable biomass generation uh, post-2027. So they're going to stop coal generation uh, by, by this quarter, end of this quarter. Um, they can't have profitable biomass generation, surely, because their cost of biomass is greater than a megawatt hour is greater than they can sell the electricity for. Well... So it's not depends on generation, is it? It depends on the subsidy debt regime. It's a, so I would say it's not profitable generation. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Um, but if we look at the cash flow statement, the cash flow statement looks absolutely fine, actually, on the current business model. So yeah. they have positive net cash flow. Dividend looks um, decently covered. You know, as things stand... It looks um, a perfectly reasonable business. Um, and analysts are forecasting growing revenues, growing dividends. Now, I think you, I don't intend to really cover the um, financials in much depth because I think if you look at the financials of this company, they look absolutely fine. And, you know, you miss the wood for the trees because the problem with Drax is not that its current financials, it's the whole business model. Yeah. So hopefully you can see the um, headline here, which is hashtag Axe Drax. And there is a whole website de devoted to trying to get the biomass subsidies that Drax is dependent upon axed. Okay, but first, I, the whole of the electricity production um, industry in the UK is in trouble because of the growth of wind and solar, which has zero marginal cost on a sunny, windy day. And so this is the UK energy mix over the last 20 years, um, which is from Ofgem. And what you'll see is that overall total electricity demand has actually been decreasing as we've become more energy efficient, particularly, for example, in the use of LED light bulbs, etc. Yeah. And so you see the coal as a portion of the mix has pretty much vanished now. Yeah. Um, and will be phased out. Gas is actually when you look at the size of these bars, gas has also probably declined. And what has grown are bioenergy, which is the dark gray, and that's almost certainly all, all Drax, wind and solar, and um, that's it. And nuclear's probably also declined. So all the growth has been in wind and solar and bioenergy. The other point, really, I think, is as, as wind and solar starts to generate increasingly si increasing size sur surfaces, battery storage technology will step in. Precisely. And, and we won't be wasting it. It, won't, it will be uh, stored for periods of time when there isn't so much generation capacity for, for the renewables. And surely that's going to affect Drax's uh, business model as well. Exactly. So basically the base load power generators, they want to have a constant price for their electricity. And what happens on a sunny, windy day is that all this electricity comes from the wind and solar farms at zero marginal cost and the price of electricity plummets. So when you look at the average price of electricity, it has been coming down. And the more solar and wind we get on the grid, the more the average price will come down. Now, when the wind and solar is, are not working, then there will be a supply gap. And the, what the government's been doing is paying base load providers like Drax money to have spare capacity. 
But as Richard's just pointed out, if battery technology improves, then we should be able to store some of the wind and solar so and release it when the wind's not blowing or the sun's not shining. Mm. So this is a bit a, an industry that is in the process of change. And Drax is one of the aging incumbents that's having its lunch slowly eaten by other participants. That uh, table on the right-hand side, Keith, which shows that the, the wholesale price is, ranges for much of the year between 20, 25, let's say, and 35, yeah. way below the 48 to 50 that Drax is claiming that it's going to be able to sell it, that it's going to sell its, its um, biomass generated electricity for. Yeah. Absolutely. It's extraordinary. Um, <clears throat> now, this shows the price the cost of different forms of electricity generation. And what you see here is that now onshore wind is the cheapest way to ge generate electricity, followed quickly by solar, then natural gas with coal and biomass at, at 75 per pounds per megawatt hour which equates to $102 per megawatt hour, it comes in just more expensive than offshore wind. So generating um, electricity from biomass is extremely expensive compared to yeah. solar and wind. Now, Drax would claim that this is the carbon cycle for biomass and it is carbon neutral okay which makes it much better for the environment than burning coal however there is a lot of there are a lot of scientific studies which basically push back on that and which now say that burn it, bu burning biomass is actually worse than burning coal. Now, why is that? And it's because when you cut down the forest and then burn it, A, you cut down the forest which stops the forest from absorbing carbon, but also you can only burn a portion of the forest you cut down. There's a lot of wastage. Right. And also you take away the, the, all the wood, which would slowly rot down and re return nutrients to the soil. So you are reducing both the, so you're stopping it from currently um, capturing carbon and you are reducing its ability to capture carbon in the future. And so what this chart shows is the efficiency of biomass compared to business as usual and business as usual is the black line the horizontal line going across and initially biomass is worse than business as usual but yeah, I, was, I was saying so that their argument would be well we will plant new trees but if you plant a sapling, the amount of carbon dioxide that it absorbs in its first year of life is far, far less than a mature tree would absorb. I mean, probably yeah. hundreds of times less than a mature tree would absorb. So you've got Absolutely. this huge lag before the new trees start to absorb the same quantity of carbon dioxide as the old trees. And yes. you the old trees. Exactly. And that's what this chart shows, Richard. It yeah. says, basically, it takes 32 years for the forest to get back to neutrality. So for the, um, you to get back to the point yeah. at which it would have been the same as just burning um, fossil and fuels. If you're gonna make it a piece of sustainable forest that you repeat it cycle through cutting down and replanting, then by removing the nutrients, you're gonna to have to apply fertilizer and the generation, the creation of nitrogen fertilizer from atmospheric nitrogen is very energy intensive. Yeah, absolutely. In that calculation, I suspect. 
but also if you um, cut down the forest every 32 years or the faster cycle of that, then, you know, do you ever get back to the stage where it would have been better just to burn some coal or some natural gas? Yeah. The other point that activists raise is that it's just a much less efficient use of land but growing um, conifers for biomass than converting it to solar PV. So this is the annual energy yield per hectare of land in the UK if you either convert them to solar PV and bear in mind that solar PV is often combined with grazing, you know, grazing sheep or something. So you don't entirely use the use of the land or planting it or a conifer plantation. And bear in mind, this is the gross energy yield of the conifers. If you were to, to then burn them in the Drax power station, you get an energy efficiency of only 35%. So actually, the figures are even worse than that. It's um, yeah, energy it's, yield is actually only 11 megawatt hours. So it's almost 50 times less energy efficient. Yeah. Or you could use one fiftieth of a hectare. Yes, well, that's right. Yeah, that's the size of a bat gun. <laughs> the, um, that's, so extraordinary. All these... that's extraordinary, Keith. Yeah. Put, oh, no. put a few solar panels on your roof and you're at, and you're creating as much energy as Drax would create by burning one hectare of uh, one hectare of conifers every year. Yeah. Now these numbers are all from biofuelwatch.org.uk, which is an advocacy group, but they are well um, documented and referenced. And if you're interested, I suggest you go and have a look. Now. When we went through the accounts earlier, everything looks great, you know, but if you do a bit of digging, and thank you for, to biofuelwatch.co.uk for pointing this out, but DRACs receive enormous subsidies in the form of renewable obligation certificates and CFDs, which provide them with guaranteed um, electricity prices. If you add those up in the half year to the 30th of June, that's 487 million, which is 974 million on an annualized basis. It's absolutely extraordinary. So essentially, this is a deeply unprofitable company without it's government a, it's subsidies. It's a subsidy gathering business, isn't it? It gathers it subsidies and, and then distributes them as dividends. Yeah. So I think the, the main business of this company is producing an endless stream of sustainability PR in order to justify massive government subsidies. It is a classic rentier sort of business. Yeah. It takes and money so, from all taxpayers, all electricity yes. users, and distributes it to a few, concentrates it and distributes it to a few who are yeah. the owners of the Drax PLC shares. Yeah. Now, there is... We do need base, base load power. So the CFD income is, um, you know, that's not necessarily linked to the sustainability, but the renewable obligation certificates definitely are. And so my point about this company is that if the government decides to listen to the activists who are saying that biomass is not good for the environment and decides to withdraw its subsidies for biomass, then Drax is not a sustainable business. It, it will plunge into deep loss. Yeah, deep and, and irreversible. Yeah, then they, the, so they're bu building a gas-fired power station at the moment. Well, they've got plans to build a the biggest gas fire station in the UK, which would be three times bigger than the other, the next biggest one um, in the medium term, which is also obviously the activists are not very happy with either. So in summary, on the current business model, Drax looks okay, but I really question whether this actually is an, a sustainable eco-friendly business 
Yeah. And if you do question that, then you have to question how long it will receive enormous government subsidies. Very interesting, Keith. Thank you for that. It certainly sheds a, a new light on what one considers to be a, an electricity generator. Thank you very much. So if you enjoyed that, please can you uh, press like and subscribe to the channel. We need a few subscribers. And I hope you will join us again on Share Talk. So thank you very much for listening to us. And it's uh, goodbye from Keith Jordan. And it's goodbye from Richard Wheater. Goodbye. Full disclaimer, the material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages or for any results obtained from use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.